Thanks, Bob. Uh, like Joanna, I'm going to come and stand on this side of the stage so that you can actually see me. So I think uh, most of you are probably aware now of what the Coral Triangle is, or where it is at least. Uh, the marine areas of Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Solomon Islands, Timor-Leste and Papua New Guinea have been identified as the centre of the centre of marine biodiversity and have subsequently been uh, a high uh, conservation priority and focus of recent management efforts. So the Coral Triangle Initiative on Coral Reefs, Fisheries and Food Security, to give it its food full title, or the CTI, was established by the governments of these six countries back in 2007 to try and address the threats to their shared marine and coastal resources in this region through accelerated and collaborative action. Through the Regional Plan of Action, the CTI has outlined five very ambitious and regional scale objectives. The effective management of priority seascapes, promoting an ecosystem approach to fisheries management, the development of a coral triangle wide marine protected area system, uh, improving coastal community resilience to climate change and protecting threatened species. Yet whilst the CTI is aspiring to these regional scale outcomes, most of the management actions that occur within this region are at much more uh, localised spatial scales. So with the exception of Malaysia, um, all of the other countries in this region have highly decentralised management of coastal and marine resources. So most management is being undertaken either by local governments or by local communities that have customary uh, tenure or ownership over their resources. There's lots of region, reasons sorry, why local management is good. Uh, local communities are the ones that are going to be most impacted by the management of their resources. So they're best positioned to design and implement management strategies that are going to be uh, accepted by local stakeholders and consequently have good levels of compliance and, we hope, ecological effectiveness. However, local management strategies are typically designed with local scale objectives in mind. So these are things which focus on food security, uh, perhaps strengthening tenure over areas or resources or cultural use objectives. And quite often what we find is that fine scale management decisions that are made within the context of these local objectives don't result uh, in outcomes which are, um, have the, perhaps the cooperative or collaborative nature which is necessary to achieve uh, these broader scale uh, objectives listed on the left here. So the Coral Triangle thus presents us with a, an archetypal case of a social, ecological, spatial scale mismatch, where the spatial scale of management and that of the ecological processes or natural resources being managed doesn't align properly. And there's several reasons why this is a bad thing. Firstly, just as a fish which swims outside of the boundaries of the marine protected area is not going to be fully protected, if there's ecological processes which are not fully encompassed by the management strategies, those are not going to be fully protected or adequately managed. Secondly, as Glenn brought up in his talk yesterday, uh, one of the risks of small spatial scale management is that the benefits from that management are going to be exported beyond the jurisdictional boundaries. So the larvae that are being exported from a protected area of reef or a spawning aggregation are going to disperse and settle on someone else's reefs. And that may have an unintended consequence of reducing the motivations for communities to implement management in the first place. Finally, inappropriately scaled monitoring frameworks lack the spatial context necessary to detect and to diagnose declines in species or ecosystems. So the hyperstability of spawning aggregations is a classic example of this. So in recognition of that spatial scale mismatch, one of the implementation strategies that's being pursued through the Coral Triangle Initiative is this idea of trying to scale up and extend the reach of very localized management through the formation of social and governance networks. So the theory goes that these social or governance networks provide incentives for communities to coordinate their action, that they then might implement management strategies more extensively or across a wider spatial area than they otherwise might. Uh, eventually, with the consequence that there's a greater likelihood that ecological processes are going to be captured. So I'll point out here that we're not just talking about networks of marine protected areas or no-take marine reserves, but networks of coordinated management. So these might also include complementary strategies such as uh, gear or effort or access restrictions. So the question that I wanted to look at is, are these uh, management networks going to be an effective strategy to achieve the objectives laid out by the Coral Triangle Initiative? And I think the answer to that question depends on our ability to understand and to align the spatial scales of two types of connectivity. Firstly, the ecological connectivity processes that underpin all of the biodiversity and ecosystem services that Christina was just talking about. 
And secondly, the social connectivity between the communities that are managing those systems. So there's widespread recognition of the fact that local scale management won't be sufficient and that we need to scale up, but how far do we need to scale up? So how large do these networks need to be? And perhaps more importantly, how far can we scale up and still have local management that's effective? So to start with the, the first part of that question, how large do MPA networks or management networks need to be to encompass these ecological connectivity processes which are necessary for the persistence of coral reef fish populations? So this is a schematic that I think has already been shown the last couple of days in various different versions. It shows the life cycle of a fish on the reef and I've highlighted a few different uh, spatial scales of movement or connectivity processes that we need to consider if we're going to be able to manage this population effectively. So starting with daily home ranges, uh, the spawning migration movements performed by some species. We heard a lot yesterday about the larval dispersal phase, where do the larvae go, how far do they go, and then the ontogenetic movement between habitat types that Simon was talking about yesterday. In the bottom left here, we've got a, a leatherback turtle reminding us that some other species in the region require connectivity processes across even greater spatial extents. So what do we know about the spatial scales of these uh, different types of movements? So this figure comes from a wonderful paper that's just been submitted, led by Ali Green at the Nature Conservancy. Myself and Glenn are both co-authors, and some of you in this room may have contributed your data as well. So this paper reviews pretty much everything we know about the movement patterns of adults and juveniles of coral reef, coral reef and coastal pelagic fish species. So you can see along the bottom here, this is a scale of movement, all these different uh, fish are mapped on there. And this scale of movement also corresponds to the spatial scale across which we need coordinated management to protect these species. So for fish with those small movements up here, notate marine reserves may be appropriate management tool. For other species which move more widely, uh, obviously we're going to be looking at different types of management strategies, but they're going to be need, need to be coordinated across these types of spatial scales. As you can see, most of these fish are swimming over to the left. There's a few fish that are swimming to the right and have red numbers in, and these fish are the ones making their ontogenetic movements between habitat types. So some fish appear twice on here uh, for their daily home range movements and then their ontogenetic movements. Oops, sorry, back, there we go. Um, I don't need to spend long on this slide because we heard a lot about larval dispersal distances and larval connectivity yesterday. Um, in the same paper, Glenn did a great job of reviewing everything that's been published so far and all the data we've got, looking at how far uh, larvae are dispersing from their source reefs. Um, there's some figures here from work that Hugo presented yesterday and some work that Pablo's done as well. And perhaps surprisingly and certainly excitingly, what we're finding is that Consistently across geographic space and across species, most larvae tend to disperse around 5 to 15 kilometers from their source reefs. If we think about spawning aggregations, we tend to think about the aggregation site itself, which tend to be highly localized, less than one square kilometer. So that appears to be a spatial scale which is actually very compatible with community-based management. Uh, but this is uh, after some work done by Kevin Rose, which shows that there's actually more different spatial scales of spawning populations that we need to consider if we're going to manage those species effectively. So in the times leading up to the aggregation, fish are going to aggregate more loosely in a staging area of around 10 kilometers squared of reefs. And at that point, they're still going to be incredibly vulnerable to fishing pressure. If we think about where the, all of those fish are coming from to attend the aggregation, so what we're calling the spawning aggregation catchment area, that may be uh, two or 300 square kilometers, maybe up to 1,000 kilometers of reef. So we need to be thinking about all of these different spatial scales if we're going to manage those species effectively. And then, of course, at the large end of the scale, hopefully some of you at the front will be able to see these lines here. So we've got some leatherback turtles that were tagged um, over here, and they're traveling all the way throughout the whole of the coral triangle. So this represents, I guess, the most acute spatial scale mismatch between uh, very localized community-based management and species which use this whole region. And this is not just charismatic marine megafauna. We need to think of high-value stocks such as the tuna stocks as well in this. So I like what Jeff uh, Jones used the term yesterday, the decade of connectivity. So in the last 10 years, we've learned a lot about the spatial extent of different ecological connectivity processes and uh, correspondingly the scale at which those need to be managed. But of course, that's only half of the story. And the other half of the story is the socioeconomic context for management and how far we actually can scale up local management and have it still be effective. 
So capacity to manage natural resources is typically embedded within scale-dependent institutional structures. So those might be defined by political boundaries or by customary tenure boundaries. And as I've already mentioned, in this region, those are incredibly small. So we're thinking about maybe one or two kilometers of the coastline. So what I'm thinking about as social connectivity is the degree to which these local stakeholders, resource users, and managers are able to collaborate, to share resources, and to work collectively to share, uh, sorry, to manage their uh, resources. So essentially, the extent to which these social and governance networks can grow and still be effective. I think most of us are familiar now with the concept that there's going to be an upper size limit at which marine protected areas can be implemented. And in this region, that's heavily constrained, by both, both by these jurisdictional areas, so the area available in which management can be implemented, and then again by the area of fishing grounds or the area of coral reef that resource users are willing to set aside to achieve specified objectives. Similarly, there's likely to be an upper limit to the extent across which social and governance networks can be implemented, and there's several things that might constrain that. So if we think of the Coral Triangle, it's a region that's characterized by very high linguistic diversity, there's complex systems of kinship and uh, resource ownership, and there's thousands of years of history of cooperation and conflict between neighboring villages and clans. And all of those cultural factors are likely to play a key role in determining whether a community is going to work with their neighbors to collectively manage their resources. Secondly, as the scale of social networks expands, the transaction costs involved in maintaining those increase. So it becomes progressively more difficult and more expensive to bring together people across a larger spatial area to have meetings and to discuss collective management. This is particularly relevant in somewhere like the Coral Triangle, which can be highly archipelagic. There's often very poor infrastructure and uh, few resources available to support uh, governance. Governance structures and nestedness may uh, also be important here. So it may be that communities within a district or municipalities within the same province may already uh, have occasions to meet and cooperate on other management issues. So they then may, may be more likely to work together on natural resource management issues than communities that are um, across different provinces or, I guess, uh, the larger scale across different countries. And finally, there may be a limit to which we can scale up management based on the need to maintain local credibility. So typically, as management is scaled up, the focus tends to shift from being on very local scale objectives to trying to also achieve more regional objectives, such as habitat representation and protecting connectivity processes. And there's a risk that if that's scaled up too far, then local stakeholders are going to perceive that these regional scale objectives are being pursued at the expense of their local concerns, at which point support for scaling up and collaborative management is likely to break down. So what's the current status or situation with these social and governance networks in the Coral Triangle? So I've been trying to explore this to look at how things are evolving and the typical spatial scales across which they are uh, being developed. So for her uh, PhD work, uh, for, uh, Vera Huige has been looking at the development of local uh, government alliances in the Philippines. So this is a map from her paper, uh, which shows 40 local government alliances. So uh, groups of municipalities that are adjacent in space, which are working together to implement marine protected area networks with shared management plans. Uh, most of these are quite small, between two or five municipalities working together, but there are examples where there's up to 20 municipalities across several provinces that are all working together to manage marine protected area networks. In the Solomon Islands, uh, communities have customary marine tenure and establish locally managed marine areas, often with support from uh, assisting NGOs, so some of the conservation organizations. This figure here, for those that are able to see, is uh, based on work that Pip Cohen has done. And you can see the dots here are the different LMMAs throughout the Solomon Islands. And the colors indicate different supporting organizations. So essentially, in the Solomon Islands, these management clusters are emerging through adjacent communities, which are receiving support from the same NGOs, which can then help to act as a bridging organization. So the Solomons actually gives us an interesting example of how the spatial extent of social connectivity might vary from place to place. So if we look here up in uh, Choisel province, um, all of the communities in Choisel come under the same indigenous organization, uh, the Lauru Lam Council of Tribal Communities. And they've been working with the Nature Conservancy to establish a province-wide uh, management network. <coughs> 
In contrast, down here in Western Province, there's much higher cultural diversity. So communities haven't self-organized to scale up in the same way. You can also see that there's a much larger uh, number of different supporting organizations working in that region. So at the moment, there's much smaller scale local networks that are evolving. In other parts of the Coral Triangle, there's different models for scaling up towards MPA networks. So there's a few examples of what I'm terming here the Kimbe Bay model, after what I guess is the best known example of a, a systematic conservation plan that was produced by the Nature Conservancy for Kimbe, Kimbe Bay, and is now uh, currently being implemented through the establishment of locally managed marine areas within conservation priority sites within Kimbe Bay. And then in other areas, notably Malaysia and Indonesia, it's uh, more common to have um, a large MPA which, with a zoning system within it. So I guess more similar to the system we have here on the Great Barrier Reef. And this is an example from Nusa Penida off the Bali coast. So another question that I'm hoping to answer here is where should we invest conservation planning efforts? So of those examples that I just talked about, some of these were occurring naturally through communities self-organizing. And in others, there was a lot more uh, input in terms of planning effort from supporting organizations. Conservation planning processes are typically require a lot of uh, resources and technical expertise. And so we can't reproduce those case studies everywhere in the Coral Triangle. So it's gonna be important for us to understand where we can make the most, most difference and where communities can essentially scale up on their own. So how do the spatial scales of social and ecological connectivity compare? Uh, by comparing these things, we can try and get at that question of whether these social networks are going to produce outcomes which can help us achieve the Coral Triangle Initiative objectives. So you can see here, this is the characteristic spatial extent of the different ecological connectivity processes I talked about. And down here, we've got the characteristic extent of different natural resource management institutions in the region. Um, and you can see this yellow shaded area here shows that there's a much wider range of connectivity processes that can be managed uh, through uh, scaling up towards these local networks. So to highlight an example from the Philippines, we can see here, this is the extent of uh, individual municipality water areas, and municipalities working on their own would be able to design and implement management strategies that can encompass the home ranges of most, but not all reef fish species, and if they're carefully placed, protect those spawning aggregation sites. However, however if they work with their neighbors to scale up towards networks, they're able to more comprehensively protect spawning aggregation populations. They can consider larval dispersal between sites in a network to ensure persistence of those species, uh, and also consider seascape connectivity, so between those different habitat types by setting representation objectives and so on. So it appears as though these local networks might provide a promising way to help overcome those social ecological scale mismatches. However, there's a couple of important caveats. The first one being that even if the ecological and social scales uh, are compatible, the boundaries rarely overlap. So Glenn brought this up in his talk yesterday, and I've borrowed one of his figures to reiterate the point again here. You can see these reefs in green are the catchment area for this spawning aggregation site in Manus province in PNG. Uh, the spatial scale is about the same as the scale of those customary tenure boundaries that are marked in white. However, of course, the boundaries don't match, so both of these communities are going to have to work together to effectively manage that population. So what that essentially means is that uh, because the social and ecological boundaries don't match up, we're going to need to manage across larger spatial scales than we might anticipate otherwise. The second very important caveat is that these local networks that I've talked about represent the potential spatial extent of coordinated management. At the moment, there's very limited capacity of local managers to design and implement management strategies with regional scale perspectives in mind. So even though they're scaling up towards these networks, most of the motivation for doing that is social and economic. It's economies, economies of scale for management or improved ability to enforce restrictions. They're not yet at the stage where they're really thinking about design designing strategies that are going to conserve connectivity processes. So everything that I've talked about today is kind of in broad terms. It's looking at characteristic extents of different processes, both ecological and social. And what would be a really exciting way to take this uh, work forward and that we now have the ecological data to try and actually map out these empirical connecti connectivity networks is to overlay those with empirical social networks to see how those boundaries match up and whether the capabilities for management also match up to those processes.
So network theory approaches might give us an approach to do that. This figure here is uh, showing social networks managing urban green space in Stockholm. And a lot of this work's been doing by the being undertaken sorry, by the Resilience Alliance in Stockholm. And there's actually remarkable similarities, if you think about it, between these urban ecosystems and customary, customary marine tenure institutions in Melanesia. They're both very finely subdivided and managed land and seascapes. So it would be interesting to further explore these approaches for a few case studies to see whether these social and governance networks are actually producing better ecological outcomes and whether networks which are designed to protect connectivity processes perform better and how much better than those networks which are self-organized. It would also be good to further explore the contextual factors influencing the strength of social connectivity. So I gave a couple of anecdotal examples of that from the Solomon Islands. But if we're able to better predict areas where scaling up is going to be able to happen on its own through community self-organizing versus where we need to have those kind of cross-scale brokering uh, organizations, then we'll be able to understand where conservation planning exercises are going to have the greatest added value. So in conclusion, uh, governance networks can help or they might help us to overcome some uh, scale mismatches in the coral triangle, of course subject to those caveats that I've mentioned. The ecological connectivity data that's being produced out of research undertaken at this center can help us to guide the process of scaling up local management. And importantly, we can dig further into that data to understand uh, particular connectivity uh, networks for the species that communities are really going to care about. So we can pull out particular fish species and say, OK, if you want to manage this species, this is the number of different communities that you need to work together with. In areas where connect social connectivity is strong and communities can self-organize, it's likely that we might achieve regional scale outcomes through scaling up alone. However, in regions with, regions with poor social connectivity and low capacity of higher level institutions, such, such as provincial networks, which is very common in the Coral Triangle, those are the sites that are going to benefit most from conservation planning efforts and are perhaps where the big NGOs should think about uh, investing their time and energy. There you go. And thanks to many people that have provided input to those thoughts and ideas. Thank you.